All righty. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, I'm Greg Dendy, uh, NANOG uh, Program Committee Chair. We'll uh, be getting started here in just a minute. I do want to throw out a reminder to fill out the surveys. Uh, we'll be announcing our survey winner uh, between the next two talks. And so uh, hopefully you filled out the survey yesterday. You may have a prize coming to you. Uh, one other note, we do still have nominations open for the Program Committee and Communications Committee for 2015. Uh, we had some discussion, uh, got some good discussion in the community meeting yesterday about ways we can in improve diversity within this, uh, within the uh, leadership of NANOG, and this is one of the ways to do it. Please, please nominate anyone you'd like to see on these committees. We very much would like to get uh, fresh blood in here. And with that, I will hand this over to Ryan Craven. Ryan is uh, here to present. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you. Bear with me. One second here. Uh, Ryan's got some live demos for us, so brace yourselves. All right, so uh, thanks for the introduction. So my name is Ryan Craven, a little bit about me real quick. I'm a recent graduate of the PhD program at Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And now I'm back on the East Coast working for the Space and Naval Warfare Center, which is in Charleston, South Carolina. It's part of the uh, US Navy. And some of my work that I did while I was at NPS was about measuring in-flight packet header modification on the internet. And so why do we want to do this? Well, we'll see it all boils down to how middleboxes interact with TCP. So prior to starting up a new connection, you know, what is TCP? TCP doesn't really know anything about the end-to-end -end path conditions between itself and a receiver you know, a priori. Uh, but during the connection, there are questions that it needs to answer in order to make the most efficient use of that path, such as how fast can I send? How much should I send at once? Uh, you know, did the other end get my data? Was it intact, piece missing, et cetera? And so in order to answer those questions, TCP has tools to make inferences during the connection. Um, you know, and some of these have been around since TCP was first created, like sequence numbers, and others over time have been added on as the network evolved and requirements changed, such as congestion control in the 80s. And so we believe that modern TCP needs to know the answer to another question, and that is, am I being misinterpreted? In other words, is some new feature that I want to use going to be properly communicated along a path? You know, one way we can check this is by looking at in-flight packet header modifications. And so the main reason we have to ask this question is because of issues with middle boxes on the network. Uh, so for example, take the scenario where two TCP endpoints, Alice and Bob, uh, communicate across the internet. You know, we've actually oversimplified this particular scenario, but what it really looks like is a bit more uh, middle boxes like firewalls, proxies, et cetera. Basically, the reality is that path is complicated by middle boxes of all types doing things like enforcing policies, expanding address space, playing tricks to enhance performance, et cetera. And there was a, a survey in a SIGCOM paper a couple years ago that surveyed some NANOG admins, and they found that across all network sizes, that this is enterprise networks, the number of middle boxes is actually on par with the number of routers in the network. And you know, what they found is a lot of these devices are standalone systems, they're hard to manage, they're expensive to buy, maintain, keep up to date, and they usually require well-trained staff to maintain and configure them. So it's not all that uncommon when stuff breaks. And in fact, that same survey found that most admins spend one to five hours a week dealing with middle box related failures, and 9% said they spend six to 10 hours a week. And in that same survey, misconfiguration was cited as the most common cause of failure when it occurred. Now that failure could be something obvious, like a bad firewall rule that blocks traffic, or what we've targeted, which is the more subtle issues that can hurt performance and protocol innovation, and which can be really hard to debug. So a good example of that that I want to get into here is with ECN. Uh, so with ECN, you have the sort of 1980s version of how the headers looked, and then you have the post-ECN version of the headers. 
And the difference being that the second byte of the IP header is now split into DSCP and the two ECN bits. And they've also reassigned some reserved bits from the TCP header. But the problem is, is that even as recently as a few years ago, so this is, you know, ECN was from first uh, started being created around 2000 or so. So it's been about 15 years. And you know, even as recently as a few years ago, research was still finding devices that misinterpreted these fields, that messed that uh, difference up between the 1980s version and the 2000 version. And in one paper, the authors discovered a switch on a major ISP that was actually messing up ECN by mistreating that second byte of the IP header. And it turned out it was an issue that the provider didn't know about. Another example that illustrates this problem pretty well is with TCP window scaling. Uh, so imagine, for example, that two endpoints are going to talk to each other, and they want to use a, a window scaling value of 7. Unfortunately, there's been real instances where a device was found zeroing out the scale value. And the result is that these two endpoints, Alice and Bob, get differing ideas of what Alice's receive window really should be. And in this case, what happens is Alice thinks her window size is 128K, whereas Bob thinks her window size is 1K. And so, you know, what does this look like to the user? So I'm going to jump back over here to the demo. You see, I started this file transfer before I came up here, and it's running really slow. Um, so I know what's wrong with this, this transfer, why it's going slow, and that's because I've put a middle box in between uh, these, two, these two hosts that is zeroing out that window scale value. And so knowing that, what I can do actually is kill this transfer and then turn, tell uh, Linux to turn off window scaling. And then try that file transfer one more time. And you can see that it actually runs so much faster now. And it's a bit counterintuitive because if you look up window scaling in the RFCs, it's in an RFC titled um, High Performance Extensions for TCP. And we actually got better performance by turning it off. And so why was that? Well, it was because of that, the middle box that's in the way. And so, you know, what are the chances that an average user would know that that's the problem, that's the reason their file transfer is going slow? And that's sort of what this, this talk is all about. So there's some other examples. Uh, ECN and window scaling are just two in a, a, a sea of IP and TCP functionality that can get disrupted by middle boxes at one time or another. Uh, there are actually other issues we've seen, such as TCP selective acknowledgments, um, artificial flow control using the receive window, and then a whole bunch of stuff in the IP and TCP option space. But the high-level takeaway from all this, though, is that you know, these are real problems. They're going to continue to occur. The network's not getting any less intelligent. And something important to stress here is that even when these issues occur on just a small percentage of connections, they can still have a wide-reaching impact. For instance, just a small percentage of connections affected is enough to dissuade, for instance, a large content provider from turning on some new feature. So in that sense, it can really hurt protocol innovation. But we do recognize that middle boxes can and actually do do a lot of useful things for operators, providers, and then also sometimes customers. And so we want, really want to be able to detect and fix these without disrupting the, the more well-behaved middle boxes. And so wouldn't it be great if we had an easy way to detect these? It could benefit researchers with new measurement tools, TCP performance extensive, in terms of performance and extensibility, and then, of course, operators for better end-to-end -end debugging and leading to happier customers. And this end-to-end -end piece is pretty important because, you know, if the problem is somewhere that's outside of our administrative control, it can be much harder to debug and it often requires cooperation from another endpoint to do some testing to, to really determine it and figure out where the problem is and, and what's causing the, those issues. So there are some tools out there already to help us with this. Uh, if you do have a cooperating endpoint, you can actually, of course, you can just run TCP dump and manually compare the output and see if uh, a mailbox is changing something in your headers. Or you can use one of the more automated tools. Uh, Nmap has a tool called Nping that's got an echo server and client that you can use. Uh, EFF has been working on some of these for uh, purposes of network neutrality. And they have a tool they, they worked on a while ago called PCAP diff, which sort of led into other tools called Switzerland and TPCAT. Uh, but one of the more useful ones it is a tool that doesn't need that cooperating endpoint like all those other ones do uh, called Tracebox. And it actually doesn't require that, that endpoint. And it has a similar methodology to Traceroute. Uh, but it goes to the extra step of parsing and, and differencing the ICMP TTL exceeded quotes that come back from 
for routers and checking to see if any middle boxes have made changes uh, between those hops. The pro is that you get the location of the modification, but there are some cons in terms of you know, reliance on ICMP and then also the same problems with reverse path measurement that you get with trace routes. And so it all kind of feeds into the main challenge, which is an available and reliable communications channel. Um, so say you're trying to communicate an integrity check between two TCP endpoints. You know, you could do something like an out-of-band ICMP, uh, maybe make a new IP or TCP option, try to redefine a field out of the header, but the problem with all of those is that the very same set of paths that will most likely disrupt those methods are precisely the paths that we're most interested in testing. Uh, so for instance, if you go to the trouble in creating a new option to carry your integrity check, it could get stripped out by a middle box. And so you need something that will be most capable of transiting all types of paths. And when you really restrict yourself to that, you also run into issues of capacity, you know, getting enough bits to, to send the information you want, and then also being incrementally deployable, making sure that you don't break anything with whatever you're trying to do. And then a more subtle issue of being middle box cooperative. Uh, so this goes back to our point earlier uh, that sometimes middle boxes can and actually do useful things for us. And so we don't want to disrupt or otherwise circumvent well-behaved middle boxes. And then also being able to inform both endpoints. And so our solution that meets each of these challenges is Hiccups, which is a lightweight TCP extension that exposes in-flight packet header modification to endpoints. Essentially what we're trying to do is automate the question, did my packets arrive at the destination with the same headers as sent? And the idea here is we're trying to detect middle boxes making changes so that we can help TCP determine whether it's being misinterpreted without interfering with the good middle boxes. And at a high level, a little bit about how hiccups works. Uh, so we actually overload three header fields out of the three-way handshake, the initial sequence number, the initial IP ID, and the initial receive window. And we overload each of those with a function of the packet headers. And so now, each of those three fields serve dual purposes. In addition to the original job, they also contain hiccups information. And we spread over three fields in case one has changed. So in some of our early work, we found that um, you can't just rely on, for instance, the initial sequence number because there are quite a few boxes out there that, that translate that and change it. And so we also use a lightweight hash function uh, because we really have a little bit of space. And in our case, we only use three sets of 12 bits. Uh, so we use a lightweight function, and we also make the assumption that there's no shared secret available, and that's so that we can work with general, in the general case with anonymous hosts on the internet. And the result of all of this is that we create an end-to-end -end tamper evidence seal over the packet headers. And we want to stress that this is different than a checksum. For instance, if a modification occurs to the packet header, we still accept that packet. It's just now, that now TCP gets some extra information about what happened and can try to take a step maybe to recover from it or work around the, the issue or bring it to the attention of the user. And so in order to use hiccups, a host TCP stack has to be enabled with it. But once that happens, hiccups can be used without endpoint coordination. Uh, our long-term vision is to try to get this into TCP. And so if all stacks included it, you know, it can kind of work in a parallel in terms of how in the way congestion control helps TCP infer end-to-end -end congestion, congestion state hiccups could help TCP infer end-to-end -end packet header modification state. And so for our implementation, we wrote a patch for the Linux kernel version 394 that alters the TCP stack in Linux to enable hiccups. And this particular addition requires no action by applications, uh, but if they want, we provide some additional optional features they can take advantage of. For instance, uh, getting the, the status from the check, uh, manually specifying certain fields that the, an application may want checked, and then also engaging what we call AppSalt mode, which is an additional um, a way to add additional protection to the hashes and make them harder to fake. And we also have a, a set of cross-platform user space tools so that we can do some one-off testing in cases where we can't or don't want to alter the kernel. So we used our tools and some measurements uh, that we ran on the general internet using Plant Lab and also Kato's Arc. And the goal being here is that we wanted to, you know, if there, the goal being with our measurements is that there was some sort of interesting behavior happening, we wanted to find it. So we tested a range of different ports and parameters. And for instance, like we, we checked different ports because prior work has shown that uh, some paths actually exhibit port specific behaviors where a middle box may be operating on one port but not the other. And so we wanted to be able to detect that and find that. And to summarize our, our measurements at a high level, 
Uh, almost half the nodes we tested uh, saw at least one in-path header modification to one of the ports that we tested. And this was more than we expected to find, especially given the nature of our, our, our measurement network. You know, we use Plant Lab, which is mostly hosted on university networks, and it should be more open in, in research networks. And so, like I said, it's a bit more than we expected. We also saw cases of asymmetric modifications where uh, the, in, the header modification only occurred to either the forward or reverse path, but not both. And so this table here shows a condensed version of all the different uh, modifications that we tested for and found. And each number on the table you see represents one of the port path pairs. And there's a few on here that I want to point out in particular. Uh, the first one being uh, ISN translation. Uh, that occurred on uh, about 8.8%. Uh, and the potential is there for TCP selective acknowledgement disruption. The idea being that you know, some older devices will translate the sequence number but then fail to also update the, the, sequ the copy of the sequence number that's placed in the, in the SAC blocks. And the result is you get two sort of out of, out of sync uh, sequence numbers. And also uh, another thing I want to point out is with uh, ECN IP code points being changed, uh, the potential is there for that, that sort of uh, disrupt between like the 1980s version and the 2000s version of the ECN. Uh, so this, is, so this, this for instance would be bad for ECN. And we also saw some cases of TCP options being stripped out, which if you think about it, it's kind of disheartening because uh, you know, options are the primary way to extend TCP in, in most instances. And so, uh, and also this was on Planet Lab and ARC, which are, you know, open networks meant for research. And we still saw about 7% of cases where the options were stripped. And, oh, sorry, and uh, I want to add that not necessarily all options, but more like the, the newer options. So um, multipath capable for multipath TCP. And also the last one on the list is an experimental option that we added for the purposes of the test. So create a new one. And, and try to, to transfer that. And we also saw instances of a new behavior to us that happened with window scaling being added. So a little more about that. Uh, we actually saw it on uh, one of the Planet Lab nodes. There was, uh, whenever we tried to send out uh, a send packet without requesting window scaling, there was a box along the path that was like, oh, I'll help you out. You missed window scaling. I'll add that back for you. And on the SYNAC, it also removed uh, the responding window scaling from the other end. and so. We never knew what was, we, we didn't know what was going on. And um, this only happened, what we discovered is only happened when we we're going out to ports 80 or 443. And window, uh, hiccups helped us detect this. So what we, what we wanted to do is we ran bulk transfer between uh, our, our plant lab node and one of our, anch our server anchor nodes. And we observed that that transfer was obviously flow controlled. And when we told each end to ignore window scaling, the throughput doubled. Uh, so in this case, we emailed the owners of the node, and it turns out they didn't know about the behavior. Uh, the issue was on one of their provider systems, and they contacted their provider to get it fixed. Unfortunately, we don't know any more details about what it was, but the cool part is that Hiccups detected something that even they didn't know was happening. Uh, it was a subtle issue that affected the whole campus, and they were able to get it fixed. And uh, I'd just like to point you to our website, tcphiccups.org, where we have uh, posted our, our code. It's available for download. Uh, you can grab one of the kernels we, and deploy it. We have some RPMs available for Red Hat Fedora. And you can also use the user space tools uh, and go and test your own networks and see what you can find. Um, if you were to do that, I'll show you real quick what that would look like. Uh, back on our little demo here. So in this case, remember what's going on here is there's a, a middle box in the way that is zeroing out that window scaling value. So this is our, our user space client here that you're looking at. And when we ran it, we find that it does detect a window scaling uh, modification happening in both directions. And that's when we probe for window scaling. If we take off this tack in here, it will not check window scaling, or yeah, it will not set a window scaling option. And when that's done, we see that there's no modifications that happen. And so what we can infer from this is there's a middle box in the way that is, uh, zero, is changing that window scaling value when we set it. And so uh, last, we also have an email address set up where you can send us any feedback. If you run, download and run the tool, any issues you have with the tool, uh, crazy middle box stories that you have, uh, any experience you get from using the tool, we'd love to hear it. So any of that is, is very welcome. And that's hiccups at cman.org. 
Okay, and with that, uh, I'm finished and I'll take any questions. Ralph Mullen, Internet Archive. I would love to use the tool and easily can put a new kernel on one end, but on the remote end, I might have more restrictions on what I can do. Is there any way to run this in user space with like raw sockets or so, just for testing purposes to see what happened? Yeah, that's actually how the user space tool works, is, is using the raw sockets. In, um, the client is cross-platform. I've got it working on Windows and, and OS 10 and everything, but there's a a server, a raw socket server that I actually have working in Linux, and it's part of that same package. You download it, um, there's an HS tool in there that, that you can run on a Linux uh, server if you don't want to use the, the kernel, for instance. We've also set up some, some measurement servers, so on the website, uh, if you actually, I think if, if you actually run the client without uh, giving it a destination, it will download a list of, of anchor nodes that we've set up and then allow you to probe those. Great. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much, Ryan.